Hi everybody, it is Tuesday, November 10th, and today we'll be talking about written agreements that are commonly facing small businesses. And as a disclaimer, anything that we talk about in the presentation today and the contents in it are intended to convey general information and not to provide specific legal advice tailored to the exact situation that your business is in. So please consult with or retain a qualified an attorney or some topics, maybe a qualified financial advisor or a certified public accountant on any matters within the presentation. And before we get into the substantive information, I wanna talk about the free legal resources for small businesses that Legal Aid Service of Collier County provides through the Florida Community Development Legal Project or FCDL. And FCDL is a statewide program that provides free legal representation to small businesses. If that small business is owned by a low to moderate income individual, and that is characterized as up to 140% of the area median income. In Collier County, this is roughly a, for a family of one, about $70,000, and for a family of four, about $90,000. And in addition to serving small businesses, we also provide free legal services to nonprofits that serve low to moderate income communities in service of community economic development. And some examples of the free legal services we provide are anything from if you're just starting out and you need assistance in incorporation or drafting internal operating agreements, which we'll talk about today, or partnership agreements, uh, we can draft or review leases, we can represent you to negotiate uh, either with a client or a vendor or a landlord or any if there's any kind of dispute going on. We can provide template client agreements for organizations to use with clients. We can help with Florida trademark registration and so much more. Really what we try to do is act as free in-house counsel or corporate counsel for our small business clients. So whatever matters come up, we will do our best to address those matters. And if you believe that you may qualify for these services, you can reach out to our intake specialist, Sherry, and her email is at the bottom of the page. And you can email her with what your business's name is and your legal needs are, and she will get you through an intake process so you can speak with an attorney. Additionally, if you that so she reach out to Sherry if you are located in Broward or Collier County, but if you are located in any other county aside from Broward and Collier County in the state of Florida, you can go to the website at the bottom of the page, flcommunitydevelopment.org, and there you will be able to apply for services as well. Or if you want to hear more about what the FCDL program does and the services it provides small businesses and nonprofits. And today we're going to talk about several written agreements that your business will commonly face. We'll start with internal operating agreements. We'll look at briefly at annual reports, non-disclosure agreements, non-compete agreements, independent contractor agreements, and how those slightly differentiate from employment agreements, commercial leases, and then a few tips if for some reason you aren't able to afford an attorney or you aren't able to qualify for our free services. So if you're somewhere in between, then also some tips for contract drafting and review that every small business owner should know. First, I wanna start with just the basic notion of the importance of putting an agreement or an understanding, whether it's with a partner or with a vendor or with a client Whatever an important agreement is, it's really, really should be in writing. Even if you trust that individual, even if that individual is um, your partner or family or someone that you trust, a close friend, it's best practice to put things in writing because the last thing you want to do is have to deal with disputing an understanding that you had. And if you think that you un had an understanding and, and that both of your minds you had a meeting of the minds, that understanding is the same. I'm, when you put pen down to paper, sometimes you'll see where there are some differences between what you and the other party thought and what 
actually that other person thinks that's different from you. So it's really important to put all agreements in writing. When the stakes are high, the last thing you want is errors in legal documents as well. And writing that, them down helps, especially when it's the beginning phases of your business. A small error can have a major consequence when things don't go as planned. For example, if somebody sues the business or a creditor comes after the business or somebody leaves the business and wants to take some of the clients or some of the work, it's really going to be important that you are able to show a judge a written legal document. And when I say legal, that doesn't necessarily mean a lawyer has to draft it, but a written document that sets out what you and your partner agreed to or what you and your employee agreed to and it will be far easier to enforce and interpret. And it likely, if uh, this dispute does arise in your small business, it's very unlikely that uh, it's going to matter what you said or how you understood something to be because a court of law is going to be looking for what was in your written legal documents. And similarly, if you do have something in writing and that's different, than um, something you agreed to after the fact, after you signed the contract, but you, you just did that verbally and you did a handshake. It's also unlikely that that's enforceable. You would need to put that second agreement in writing as well. Um, one of the biggest reasons for that is in most contracts, it says, and, and the purpose of a written agreement really is that you wanna have all of the agreement in the four corners of the document, the four corners of that, that page. And anything you agree to outside of that should either amend that written agreement or supplement it and you know, just be incorporated into it. So uh, that we're not just talking about the value of putting an agreement in writing at the beginning, but every time something changes in that agreement, it should be put down in writing and signed by both parties. The first written document that faces small businesses very commonly, every small business that's incorporated is an internal operating agreement. And these have several different names for a, a, the corporation. We call it bylaws or a limited liability company or LLC. We call it an operating agreement. And in a partnership, we call it a partnership agreement. And really all of, they're all, and collectively I'm referencing them as internal operating documents and really what internal operating documents do is detail operational and financial management of the company. So when if something goes wrong, if a partner leaves, if the business goes bankrupt, if the business is sued, if a creditor comes after it, you have exactly how the business is supposed to be run and managed in this internal operating document. And I say internal because it's not something that is required to be disclosed in public record. It's only internal for you and whoever you allow in your business to see it. So things you wanna consider putting in there. Ownership, who are the owners? Because some owners may have authority to manage the day-to-day -day of the business. Other owners may just be merely investors and they're not responsible for managing the day-to-day -day of the business. So you'll wanna separate that. Who's an, who's an owner with authority to run the business and who's an owner that doesn't have authority to run the business, but is just putting equity in, for example. Um, detail how, what the rights to sell ownership in the company are. Um, some people, for example, in LLC, uh, wanna restrict, heavily restrict being able to sell membership shares or ownership shares in the company. Others may be willing to let anyone be able to buy into the company. So if you want to, especially a lot of small businesses really want to restrict who can purchase ownership in a business. So it's really important to detail that in an op internal operating document. How it's managed, how the business will pay taxes. I've said this in my previous webinars, but some of the pillars to a very successful small business are having an attorney, having an accountant and having someone, an insurance agent and always checking in with those three parties. For how the business will pay taxes, you wanna get that right and put it in a document so that you don't have any of your partners contesting that. 
um, how the profits and losses will be distributed should be addressed, how much each owner paid into the business, and if any owner has a duty or responsibility to pay an additional sum at a later date, how much each owner may have to pay in the future, duties and responsibilities of each owner, voting classes and voting rights. You can create different voting classes uh, and all of that, again, should be detailed in the operational and financial management document or internal operating agreement. And if this agreement doesn't, if you don't have one, um, it's gonna, it could create a lot of problems. For example, I have a client that had to, we had to represent them to help prove that he was actually an owner in the business, even though it was very obvious. He had been involved in the business for several years. He had invested funds. He had shown up and gone to work there every day. But one of the other partners was arguing that he was merely an employee and wasn't actually an owner in the business. And it was very difficult to prove despite it being such an obvious thing in this individual's life, because he was obviously dedicating his life to this business, um, because there was no, it was an LLC. So there was no operating agreement that detailed he was an owner and that he had authority to manage the business on a day to day. And here's the amount of money he put in the company so far. And in two years, he was responsible to put this much more into the company. Uh, it, because those things weren't spelled out, we had to go through a lot of time and effort, tax documents, bank records from years and years back, a, a huge headache and a lot of time wasted on this that could have been time put in the business and making it more profitable. So it is my strongest suggestion that anyone that has a business, um, if you are a partnership, an LLC or a corporation, take the time, whether you're new or you've already been in business for years now and you realize how important it is to get one of these internal operating documents. Of course, this is something we represent our clients for, um, but uh, if you can't afford an attorney, I think this is, or if you can't, uh, excuse me, don't qualify for our program, it's really important to consult with an attorney and, and get these things written down. Because if you don't have one, state law determines everything that will happen to you and your partners or other owners. And that may not what be what was intended, or it'll be extremely difficult to prove in a court of law. So for example, if you don't have an internal operating document and you've put in 90% of the money for the business and your partner has put in 10, uh, state law is going to likely determine that you're both 50-50 owners because you didn't write anything otherwise. That, so despite having a different and uneven capital contribution, you actually only get 50% of the profits, which likely is not what you intended. If you put in 90% of the capital contributions, you likely want 90% of the uh, returns afterwards. And if you, uh, this is something that we draw for our clients regularly, but when it comes down to the, the nitty gritty details and what's best for your business, we also have several amazing free organizations that can help you come up with, you know, how you want your business to operationally and financially be managed. In Collier County, we have SCORE Naples and they provide their clients free business counselors. And they not only help with these matters, they can help with marketing plans, business analysis, business plans, uh, market competition, social media, and they are just a wealth of resources and work really hard to make sure that their clients' businesses are a success. And these, most of the programs they offer are free of charge. The counselors are free of charge. And they also provide several classes for businesses on business management. In addition, Goodwill of Southwest Florida's micro enterprise program provides classes for small businesses. And they are, I believe, two times a week for a few hours each night. It's, a, it's short, but an intense few weeks of courses and students get to graduate with just basic business and entrepreneurial knowledge and successful graduates have a chance to apply for micro loans from Goodwill as well. And I highly recommend both of these organizations. Our most successful clients usually work with both of them. In addition, if you're in Broward County, two resources I can recommend are the Urban League of Broward County that does similar things as the two Collier organizations I recommended. In addition, there is the Florida Women's Business Center that also does similar 
items. So really, once you, it, it's, there's so many great free legal resources out there to make your business a success. And law is just not, is just one part of it. Again, having a tax professional to be able to consult with, having an insurance agent to consult with, and then using these free resources for business guidance will help make you, put you in the best place for your business to succeed. The next written agreement that commonly faces small businesses is an annual report. And this is very simple. It might even take you under a minute to do. Um, after you've incorporated your business, and if that is a foreign concept to you, I highly recommend going to Legal Aid Service of Collier County's YouTube channel uh, or reaching out to Legal Aid where, where to find it. And we have a webinar that we discuss um, differences in four types of entities, sole proprietorships, partnerships, limited liability companies and corporations, and the different liability protections that each offers. So highly recommend that as well. So if you are a limited liability company or a corporation, you're also responsible for filing, filing an annual report each year in May. It's usually due around May 1st. This year it was actually extended due to the pandemic. But the purpose of this document is to update the state and consumers. So any of your hypothetical hypothetical or actual clients, it's to update them regarding any changes or lack of changes in your organization. So when you incorporate your business, you file your articles of incorporation if you're an LLC or if you're a corporation or your articles of organization if you're an LLC and you put the business name, the business address, who the owners are, really simple information that becomes public record. Each year, you're going to get an email and a postcard from to the email and the address that you used when you filed your articles. And it's going to remind you that on May 1st, you're going to have to submit an annual report to say any updates, anything that's different from your articles or that nothing is different and everything is the same. And filing your articles is important because it maintains active status. And it's important to have active status with the Florida Department of State because it prevents you from piercing the corporate veil, which would prevent liability, which would bring personal liability on you rather than having liability on your business. And if piercing the corporate veil is a foreign concept, again, go back to the previous webinar I recommended and that will be discussed in detail there. There is also a filing fee to be paid with your annual report. I think it's about $60. However, if you don't pay your annual fee when you file your annual report, uh, there is a $400 non-negotiable late fee. So you will essentially either have to pay that late fee or um, dissolve your business. Your business will automatically dissolve. And if you want to continue without paying the $400 fee, you may have to incorporate a new business. So it's very messy. It's very it's not needed to, to file it late. If you do file it late, there is no way to negotiate the way out of that $400 fee. Even if somebody was sick or if you were in a car accident, the state does not, isn't in the business of hearing any excuses, even if they're really good and reasonable excuses. And $400 is a lot of money. So it's really important to file and pay for that annual report on time. Put it in your calendar and always make sure that you have the correct address and email in your articles and in your annual reports registered with the state because that's where you're going to get those annual reminders to file it. Another agreement commonly facing small businesses are non-disclosure agreements. And this is one of the most common requests from my clients to draft. And this is an NDA is how we abbreviate it. And an NDA is a legally enforceable contract between a business that has confidential information and a person or entity to whom that confidential information is going to be disclosed. So what is confidential information? One, you can actually define it in your own, um, in your own NDA that you draft. You can define exactly what's confidential information. Maybe it's who your list of vendors is. Maybe it's your pricing. Maybe it's your business uh, contacts. Maybe it's your client list. Maybe people are looking at confidential information that belongs to your clients every day. 
And when so every business has information that's confidential and you wanna protect it by drafting an NDA agreement. And the more details you can put in that NDA agreement of what is confidential, the more likely a court will enforce it and protect that confidential information. And the two ways you can draft an NDA are first with your employees. So if you want to prevent your employees or independent contractors from disclosing your confidential information to third parties, whether or not they're still employed by you. Um, so this could be during the employment and after the employment, you have your employees sign an NDA. And oftentimes you may be working with third parties. Maybe you're considering selling your business. Maybe you're consider or a real estate transaction. If you're purchasing something, people are going to go through your financial records or um, maybe you're negotiating uh, or talking about with an employee or independent contractor to hire them and they need to know some confidential information about the business. So this an NDA can also be enacted with third parties and typically it's used to facilitate a business deal while still protecting the confidential information that your business has. When you have an NDA, you also, and, and if something happens and you have to enforce it, you can actually list what the remedies are in your NDA. So, you know, if you can be as specific as you want, and this is a bit of a complicated legal issue, so I do consult, I do recommend consulting an attorney. Again, if you qualify for our free, free legal services, this is something we can put in the agreement for you, and it will actually spell out what you get if the party that entered the NDA with you violates that NDA and shares confidential information, we can say exactly what the business is going to be entitled to for them breaching that NDA. However, in most cases, the ultimate enforcement of an NDA will be through a breach of contract claim. And a breach of contract claim is actually litigation. So that's in the courtroom. And litigation is very, very, lengthy and expensive and uh, draining of um, emotional and actual resources. So uh, it, it is really, it, it sometimes we do recommend outlining remedies for violations in an NDA, uh, just to be able to avoid having to litigate that in court. Another super common agreement that faces small businesses and that we are regularly asked to draft for our small business clients are non-compete agreements. And a non-compete agreement is where an employee promises not to compete with an employer's business during the employment and not just during the employment, but for a specified time after termination of the employment. So generally employees agree not to work for other employers that are that employer's competitors. And they'll agree not to solicit the employer's customers for a specific period of time. And this and, and, and non-competes are very difficult to enforce. And how, well, how courts will look, what the, the threshold that they'll look at to interpret them is quote, that they have to be reasonably necessary to protect the legitimate business interest of the party trying to enforce it. And this means that employers must show the judge that the business would be harmed in some way if the non-compete agreement was not enforced. And, I, and most times my clients come and they say, I wanna prevent this employee from ever taking any of my clients and forever working in Collier County or Broward County in this field again. And that's super unreasonable. It, it really goes beyond uh, what's reasonably necessary to protect the legitimate business interest. So the more reasonable you can make a non-compete agreement, the more likely a judge will enforce it against uh, the individual or business that you had signed the non-compete. And so the more reasonable we can get it, more enforceable. In the state of Florida, the reasonable time period and geography to enforce a non-compete agreement is typically limited to a maximum of two years. Courts have consistently interpreted them preventing employees through a non-compete to be able to work in that field for over two years is unreasonable. 
Um, also, you know, depends what the radius is, if, you know, if how far they can work. Sometimes it might not just be Naples, Florida or Fort Lauderdale, Florida, but um, it may be too far to say all of Collier County or all of Broward County are places that this person cannot work in this field. Um, so you just want to actually sit down and go, where, how far would it actually be that it would potentially affect my business if this individual opened up shop? Maybe you're only worried about a one mile radius. That's more enforced, that's more reasonable, and that's much more likely a judge is going to enforce it rather than an entire county or a 50 mile radius. And employees should be able to reasonably continue to work and the non-compete can't harm the employer's um, competition to find new employees. So you can't unreason unreasonably restrict the employee from having, being able to be a breadwinner. They have to be able to go and get another job. So if it's the non-compete is just way too restricting, again, a court is just going to throw it out. So you wanna sit down and think, what's the actual, you know, how long am I actually concerned about? Are you concerned about six months, one year, two years? Typically you can't go over two years. And how far am I worried about? If you're a brick and mortar, it's you really shouldn't be concerned about the entire county. You should probably be concerned just about a couple mile radius of you. But if you are a business that consistently, uh, you know, is working throughout the county, maybe your virtual business, uh, e-commerce business, you know, then we can discuss and tailor that. But those are a lot of the considerations in a non-compete. I think non-competes are very, a very great issue because if they aren't tailored specifically to the kind of business and reasonably tailored to protect legitimate business interests, if they go too far um, in years or, or mile radius, it becomes more and more unlikely it's enforceable. So the more reasonable you can be, the more likely you'll be able to protect your business from competition. probably the biggest thing we get asked to draft for our clients is independent contractor agreements. And an independent contractor is very different from an employee. So before we talk about independent contractors, you need to make sure that that's actually appropriate and that that individual isn't better identified as an employee. And these have really big tax consequences with IRS. So you wanna make sure you get this right. And if you are not an employee of a company, but instead if you're working as a freelancer or self-employed worker, you're more likely an independent contractor. And I've listed on this slide some key bullet points where independent contractors have significant differences from employees. For example, independent contractors pay their own taxes on income earned. They're not eligible for company benefits such as health insurance or retirement plans. They do not receive unemployment benefits. They're not subject to any laws regarding discrimination, wages, or hours worked. They are typically not trained. They should have the skill set already. And they set their own hours of work. They decide how the job will be completed and may even work from home. So really, the more control that a business puts on an independent contractor and the more restrictions they put on them, you know, hours they have to work, what kind of software they have to use, what kind of work product a business needs to see, depending on the circumstances, the more control a business puts on, the more likely they're not an independent contractor, but are more likely an employee. For example, if you restrict your independent contractors from being able to work for other businesses, then they're actually an employee. Or if you say that an independent contractor has to work between the hours of nine to five every single day, Monday through Friday, and they don't have flexibility with their hours, it's not definitive, but it may mean looking at other factors that it's an employee. So it's a very delicate balance and you kind of have to go through everything and you wanna make sure you get it right because the, the potential litigation, if it is an employee rather than an independent contractor, that independent contractor sues you and goes, actually, I'm an employee and I'm entitled to all of these laws that employees are entitled to, entitled to, then that's going to create a big problem. So this is another area where I strongly recommend sitting down with an attorney and determining whether someone working from your business is an independent contractor or an employee. But if they have a lot of flexibility, more likely an independent contractor. 
And when you have an independent contractor, you should still have an independent contractor agreement. That's a common question I get. I'm not an employee. Do I actually have to have anything in writing? Yes. You should definitely have something that spells out the terms that both of the parties agree to. And you don't want to assume anything is understood. You want to have it in writing. So some things to consider including in an independent contractor agreement are who are the parties? Is it, if, it, if you're entering this agreement as your business, enter into it as your business, not your individual name. And oftentimes independent contractors actually have an LLC or corporation that they are an independent contractor under. So you're going to enter into the contract with that entity rather than the independent contractor as an individual if they have one, if they have a business entity, or you just enter into it individually. If you are an independent contractor, I do recommend talking to an attorney about setting up an LLC or corporation to do your work under, to run your business under. Next, you should clarify exactly what the purpose of the relationship is. So this can be um, a specific project. Maybe the independent contractor is only helping with one thing or only specific days of the week or a one-time thing or multiple times or in perpetuity. So the purpose and timing of the relationship should be put in there. And when I say timing, when does the independent contractor agreement start and when does it end? Or is there an event that will trigger when it ends? Or is it a certain date? Or does it just go on until one of you terminate it? And if one of you, if you can terminate it, you should, can, should consider, can you terminate it for cause? Or can you, do you not need to have any cause? Can you just say, I'm gonna give the party 30 notice and then we can terminate this and I will no longer be an independent contractor with this business. What are the payment terms? When does the independent contractor get paid? What do they get paid? What are the party's responsibilities? Who has to, has what, who has to have what kind of insurance? You can also include language, NDA, non-disclosure agreement language in your independent contractor agreement. And you can also insert non-compete language. But with independent contractors, non-competes are scrutinized even more closely by the courts. So again, that's another thing that you really need to have an attorney look over, including a non-compete in an independent contractor agreement. Of course, if you are a brick and mortar store and have a physical location, however, that's becoming less and less prominent now with the pandemic. But if you do have a physical location, a common written agreement, your small business is going to see are lease agreements. And you wanna make sure that you have the right terms in your lease agreement. And uh, two weeks ago, we pre legally presented a presentation on renegotiating or terminating your commercial lease during as a result of COVID, um, but it also talks about just general ways and general reasons to renegotiate or terminate a lease. So again, that is on Collier County's, or Collier County, our a YouTube channel, excuse me. So check that out if you wouldn't want to get some tips for negotiating. Actually, it, it is specified for leases, but there are also just negotiation tips when it comes to other matters in small businesses. So when you have a lease, if you have a brick and mortar, Review the terms of the lease and make sure you accept everything in the lease because once you sign it, it's almost impossible to get out of it. So pay attention to the term, the start and end date. What's the security deposit? How do you get the security deposit back? What are late fees for paying rent late? How, how do you terminate the lease? What are utilities, electric, water, trash removal, internet, gas, phone? All of that should be included in the, in the lease. And oftentimes there's going to be rent increases each year or every other year. And what are those rent increases? When do they start? How much are they? What are they based on? It should detail who's in charge of maintenance, repair and improvements. Sometimes the tenants actually lie in charge of that, not necessarily the landlord when it comes to your own individual unit. What insurance are you required to have? Do you have enough parking? Making sure, even though it's just dreadfully awful to have to go through a commercial lease and read all of those lease terms, you want to make sure that you're comfortable with and understand everything in there because a lease is one of the hardest things to get out of, especially if even if you entered into it as your business, you have those liability protections. Oftentimes, commercial landlords want tenants to sign a personal guarantee where you would personally guarantee uh, that you will be liable for unpaid rent 
if you aren't able to pay rent one day. So make sure that you read through that awfully boring lease and, and make sure that you understand the lease terms. And again, touching briefly on if you need to negotiate with your landlord due to COVID-19, Despite the pandemic, there hasn't been a law that requires commercial landlords to wait to evict or gives tenant a break if they're late on rent or cuts rent down or waives rent, even despite those required business disclosures. So instead of relying, relying on law or a lawsuit to contest a lease, it's more likely that appealing to your landlord through negotiation is the better way to do that. And the two biggest tips I can give based on our client's experience is to first be proactive. Do not wait until the last minute. And if your land, landlords are all losing money, they're, you know, they, they're paying for a lot of things. They're, help, they're trying to help their tenants be able to maintain their business. They're not sure if they've been waiving rent. Um, you know, they're not sure if they're going to be able to collect that rent in the future. So landlords are also losing a lot of money in addition to tenants. And a lot of tenants are asking for rent assistance. It's likely not just your business, but others in the same unit. So you don't want to be the last one in line to negotiate when the landlord has already done it with several other businesses. And it is November and it has been a while since the pandemic started. So if you are someone that is does need to renegotiate your lease uh, and maybe you've had rent waived or you've had rent cut or you keep promising you're going to pay it back, don't wait to negotiate with the landlord. In addition, you want to be prepared. Um, uh, going back to being proactive, it's the end of the year and a lot of lease terms are going to have rent increases. So take a look at your lease, see if there's a required rent increase. And even if you are able to pay it, go back to your landlord and explain how, um, if, especially if you have, you know, maintain, you've been paying your lease, you haven't missed out on any rent payments, you haven't, um, or maybe, you know, you, you've been a really great tenant, even despite the pandemic. I would go and ask and see, hey, I see that in January, I have a rent increase of one or 3%. I'd like to negotiate getting rid of that because of the pandemic and I'm having a harder time keeping up with my business. Landlords are much more reasonable than you think. You are a very profitable business to them as well. And it doesn't hurt to ask. You can't get kicked out of your lease just for asking to renegotiate it. Second, be prepared. Landlords may request information, including the status of your business, the current and past sales numbers to show an impact of COVID on your business, whether you have any kind of insurance to cover losses. So having that information organized and ready, rather than the landlord having to ask you to get it all together and you hand it to them, uh, maybe in a disorganized manner or fashion, you know, you want to make it easy for your landlord to say yes to what you're asking. And if you have all of these documents ready to go, um, that explain why you're late on rent or why you haven't been able to pay rent, but why you believe that you will be able to turn your business back around. Maybe you're waiting for PPP funds. Maybe you're waiting for an SBA disaster loan. But look, here's all this information in the meantime. You know, just be prepared that you have that for your landlord. And if you do need to negotiate your commercial lease, here are some um, ideas. There is no perfect formulation for the perfect negotiation. You just have to be reasonable, be flexible, and expect some back and forth. It will take some time. I very rarely have a negotiation that doesn't take several weeks, if not over a month. So you want to um, things you can consider. You know, pick and choose what which one of these works for you and how you can negotiate with the landlord. One is rent abatement. You know, is your is can will your landlord consider forgiving all or part of future rent payments or past rent payments. And rent deferral, are they able to defer rent? Maybe if you couldn't pay the last few months because of required business closures, you can extend your lease and defer rent to a later date, or you can pay it back, You know, increase your monthly rent period over time. You can ask to, as I just mentioned, waive rent increases, usually the beginning of the year or um, each year, once your lease term starts, rent increases. You can ask that that no longer apply. You can extend your lease. Maybe ask if you had three months of rent abated that 
you will now extend your lease three months, six months, one year. You can ask to waive late fees. I, I doubt there's a commercial lease that doesn't impose late fees. You can ask that the, when rent is paid late, so ask that those be waived. You can ask to use your secu security deposit for rent. You can move into a more affordable space that your landlord has. Maybe you've lost some employees. Maybe they have a you know less appealing unit that you can save and move into that space. You can ask them to allow subleasing, so you can you know get some subtenants in there that maybe you share the space. For example, if you're a hair salon owner, maybe you do it. You use it Monday through Thursday, seven to seven, and they use the other days of the week. Uh, you can try to ask for rights to sublease because if you don't have the right to sublease in your lease, you may not have it. Mm -hmm. So this, or it, oftentimes it requires, your lease may say that you have to get the landlord's written permission. Mm -hmm. Note that landlords, lenders may not allow rent adjustments or mortgage forbearance. Mm -hmm. So some things the landlord's not going to be do, be, be able to do based on what their lender requires. And also noting that Collier County has grant money for small businesses. And if you get your books in order, you can apply for those. And I have links to all the places you can get more information on that from our last presentation last week, again, on the Collier County Legal Aid's YouTube channel. Uh, in addition, Broward County's CARES grant money, the application opens, um, I think it may have opened yesterday. And, um, and if not any day now, again, those dates are in my last presentation. So please um, make sure to get your books and your financial records in order because I can't tell you how many clients I have that did qualify for the money and didn't get it because their financial books weren't in record, weren't, excuse me, financial records weren't in order. And again, those free resources I mentioned, um, Score Naples, can help you, they're a partner with SBA, they can help you go through your uh, financial records in addition to the Urban League and Broward County can do that. And in last week's presentation, I had a link and that listed any SBA partner that provides free resources and help to get financial records in place. Those financial records have to be clean and in place in order to apply for these funds. So please don't just check it off the list and go, oh, I have a profit and loss statement. Let me send that over. Here's my tax returns. It may still get denied for not quote unquote substantiating economic loss. So take the time to have someone and one of these free resources look through them. And most importantly, when you do change the terms of your lease, put your changes in writing and have both parties sign it. And then finally, I've included some common clauses that businesses should include in their, their contracts. One, who the parties are. Spell out who the parties are entering into the contract. Not just that, it may not be an, it's not individually who you're negotiating with and you individually may not be entering the agreement, but entering into it as your business. So don't enter into it under your individual name, enter into it under your business name and see if the party you're negotiating with has a business that they're going to enter it under their business name or individual name. In addition, have them include their address in their email. So if there is a breach of the agreement and you have to enforce it, that you can easily find that person despite if they've moved uh, or um, aren't responding. Spell out termination. How, what are the term and rate, termination rights for each party? Of course, you, generally you can terminate an agreement for cause, you know, if they've breached the agreement or if they've done something wrong and you can spell out what those reasons for termination are. However, maybe it's appropriate to have the agreement be terminated not for cause and you just give 15, 30, 60 days notice and both parties can terminate. Or does termination occur at a certain date or after a certain event? Three, force majeure clauses. We talked about this in last week's presentation. And force majeure clauses relieves both parties from liability or obligations when an act of God or a circumstance beyond parties control occurs, such as hurricanes, but most importantly, because of the pandemic. And a lot of force majeure clauses weren't able to be interpreted, releasing parties from having to perform under the agreement because it didn't list the word specifically pan pandemic or COVID-19. 
So the more specific you can list, you have to, is, courts have, want to see very specifically what the events are for excusing performance under an agreement in this force majeure clause. So make sure that you list exactly what it would be. Would hurricanes prevent it? Would a terrorist attack prevent it? Probably, it's really, you know, we don't, and I, we've really learned over the last few months how these quote unquote acts of God can prevent us from working. So be sure to have a force majeure clause that says what excuses performance of the agreement for both parties. And if you can include pandemics, COVID-19, national emergencies, um, terrorist attacks, wars, the common things that will prevent most many businesses from being able to perform. Fourth, third party terms and conditions. If you have a third party that imposes terms and conditions on you and you need to have those terms and conditions apply to your clients, then you can impose them. You can include relevant portions and require the client to be held to that same or relevant terms as you are. For example, if you're an event planner and you have certain items that you rent from a rental company and that rental company has terms and conditions that they impose on you, the event planner, uh, you want to pass those off onto your clients as well. So you can show them the terms and conditions, or you can pick certain terms and conditions and include it in a client template agreement and say that you are also held to these standards about not losing items, not staining items, etc. Very important, having an attorney's fees provision. And this means that if the, the lose in American jurisprudence, everybody's entitled to, everyone's required to pay for their own attorney's fees, even if you win. And attorney's fees can be extremely expensive, ranging from $300 to $800 an hour. And the time it takes for attorneys to litigate is a lot. So you, if you feel comfortable, you'll want to put an attorney's fee provision that prevents that would allow the party that wins a lawsuit to get their attorney's fees covered by the losing party. And how this might look and most commonly is quote, the prevailing party shall have the right to collect from the other party, it's reasonable costs and necessary disbursements and attorney's fees incurred in enforcing this agreement. So that way, technically you would not be liable for paying attorney's fees if you won a case, your case. And finally, venue and jurisdiction. It's a very globalized world. We do business outside of the borders of the state of Florida all the time, especially if you're in e-commerce. So you would wanna put in your written agreements where a lawsuit would be heard. You don't want it, even though you may have sold a product um, to Arizona, you may not want it to actually be litigated there. So I recommend putting in a clause such as, quote, the jurisdiction of any proceeding between the parties arising out of or with respect to this agreement shall be in a court of competent jurisdiction in the state of Florida and venue shall be in Collier County or wherever county you are doing business and each party shall be subject to the personal jurisdiction of the courts of the state of Florida. So that way, someone can't drag you up to New York or California to litigate what's in the agreement because you're already specifying specifying in the agreement, if that were to occur, you're going to litigate it in the state of Florida, in the call year of your, in the county of your choosing. And I'm going to leave a few minutes for questions if anybody has any. If you're watching this as a recording after live, please feel free to um, give us a call or email with any questions you may have. And I have left again Sherry's email up on the screen. If you believe that you qualify for our free legal services, please reach out to her with ways that we may be able to assist. And thank you so much for your time today. Um, after the new year, if you are interested in learning more about nonprofits, the, I'll also be doing a presentation on how to start a nonprofit. And if there aren't any questions, thank you so much for your time and have a good day and best of luck with your business.